Good evening, and welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. My name is Andrew Schwartz, and I am uh, CSIS's Senior Vice President for External Relations. Uh, tonight is my pleasure, and indeed an honor, to introduce a true public servant and innovator, uh, Ms. Lori <coughs> Bertman, who is President and CEO of the Irene W. and C. B. Pennington Foundation of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. CSIS's partnership with LSU and its Stevenson Disaster Management Institute is one of our most important collaborations. Thanks. And I've seen many of you at our you. events this year, and I'm so grateful that you could continue to support us and come back and you know, <coughs> learn from us at these sessions. Our partnership with LSU is the vision of Lori Bertman and that really established the series and forged this crucial partnership. Uh, the series is the first of its kind in Washington. It's an ongoing examination of the issues surrounding disaster management and emergency response. And over the past year, we've held sessions with uh, FEMA's talented and thoughtful administrator, uh, Mr. Craig Fugate, uh, with Admiral Thad Allen, the National Incident Commander, who gave his first remarks following the <coughs> Gulf oil spill here at CSIS, at this series, at the inaugural event of this series. But tonight we have something truly unique and remarkable. Again, it's through Lori's vision that we're able to take a substantive and thoughtful look at the role of philanthropy in disaster preparedness, relief, and recovery. As I mentioned um, before, this isn't Lori's day job. Uh, her day job is running Louisiana's largest private family foundation where she helps provide support uh, to the disadvantaged of the great state of Louisiana. Somehow, though, she finds time to be a tireless advocate for the disaster-stricken communities mm -hmm. and a cutting-edge innovator in the world of disaster policy and philanthropy. Um, I'd like to quote uh, Mayor Mitch Landrieu of New Orleans, who couldn't be here tonight. But he wanted um, you all to hear something about Lori Bertman, who has, uh, as you all know and I've said, has helped <coughs> us establish this series. Mayor Landrieu uh, told me, there's no one I know of who's more passionate selfless, committed to helping disaster-stricken communities recover from the immense challenges they face than Lori Burton. As an innovator and a leader in the field of emergency response and disaster philanthropy, I have sought and benefited from Lori's thoughtful counsel. She's one of, few, she's one of the few professionals who is thinking about how we as a nation can be more proactive and get, a get ahead of disaster situations before they get the best of us. Lori's a determined woman. She actually even convinced a Tulane graduate, me, to partner with LSU. <laughs> and boy, am I glad she did, because now I have a football team to root for. <laughs> but also because we're doing, what we're doing here in Washington is a real game changer. We're changing how policymakers and thought <clears throat> leaders and those in the private sector view their respective roles in helping forge smart disaster policy. We don't have all the solutions yet, but we're well on our way to a greater understanding of this complex set of issues because of the vision and tireless commitment of Lori. Lori, with CSIS's deepest gratitude for your service and commitment and for helping us establish the series, uh, it's my pleasure to give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might have been the nicest introduction I have ever received. Um, and um, when the funder of the series asked to be the moderator, you get to kind of be the moderator. So <laughs> um, they usually say yes. But thank you so much, Andrew. And I want to thank CSIS for um, hosting an event on philanthropy. This is really the first of its kind um, up here on stage. You let the private sector people in. And I'm um, very excited about that. Uh, to give our viewpoint about how we can all work together. Um, and I'm very thrilled that this is part of the LSU series of emergency preparedness and, and uh, disaster response. Um, and I love that there's this am amazing audience out here. Um, we read over the audience list, and you are a very diverse audience. I, I'm not sure that any of us have ever spoken to such a diverse audience on this topic. And I think that's a great start in terms of building um, collaboration and coordinating our efforts. Um, I, have to, I do have to thank Andrew and his team, Allison, Nicole, and Ryan, 
for putting uh, this together, as well as Rick Ozzy Nelson, the director of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program, um, and his associate Rob Wise for their outstanding job pulling together this event. Um, and I also do need to recognize Tom Anderson, my dear friend and partner in, in crime from LSU, SDMI, um, who's there in the back. He is a tremendous practitioner, a disaster <laughs> practitioner and resource in Louisiana, um, an amazing partner in this venture. And I will honestly tell you that everything that Andrew said about me times it by 10, and we will be, to you, I could refer to these three people that I'm up here with. Um, this, the distinguished panel that, that I've been able to get to come here who have flown in from Nashville, LA, and Baton Rouge to be here. Um, to talk to you about this issue. When Andrew and I co-founded the um, series, the main objectives were really to work <coughs> collaboratively with a funder, um, academia, and a think tank. And the, the second objective was also to have a discussion about uh, um, disasters when they weren't going on. And that's one of our main issues, as many of you who have lived through disasters trying to get work done, trying to be strategic, trying to build relationships, trying to give out money or raise money in the middle of that chaos um, and to collaborate with people is very difficult. So we wanted to have a forum where we could do that in peacetime, if you will. And finally, I said the rule, because I had been through Katrina and lived through Katrina, um, my rule was no lessons learned. We had been to enough lesson learned. We really wanted to talk about innovations and solutions and really think through that. And to quote my, one of my mentors, Billy Shore, who uh, was the former president of Share Our Strength, a, a hunger prevention organization here, he said, you know, it's not that we don't know, you know, it, it, we know the problems. And it's not that we don't know the solutions. We, do, we actually do know the solutions. We don't have the creativity to implement the solutions. <laughs> and I always think about disaster when I think about that quote. Um, I, and, and when I think of philanthropy, I think of, of flexibility, creativity, experimentation, um, innovation, entrepreneurship, and not to mention um, cash, which is also a big part of implementing um, solutions. Um, so I got to pick this wonderful, and I, and I mean cherry picked this wonderful panel, um, kind of based on three, three issues that I want to frame the discussion. Um, the first is, is kind of looking at philanthropy in the entire landscape of disaster management and disaster giving. Uh, we tend to wall work in our own silos, and we tend to um, only um, work with the folks in our own field. But I want us to take a look of how we look, what we can do, and what role we can play, and not just as mere gap fillers, but maybe even more than that, um, along with the, all the actors in, 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 um, in uh, disaster work. And then also to show innovative private and public partnerships that we have already been involved <coughs> in, and hear from you as an audience some of the things that you think could we can do um, with the, both the public and private sector. And then finally, just to generally learn the trends and the do's and the don'ts and what we're seeing and, and really kind of what we hope um, to see of, of our field in, in, um, as it relates to disaster giving. Um, before I um, introduce my panel, I do just want to give you a teeny context on philanthropy and uh, in general, because I'm not making an assumption that all of you work in philanthropy and know generally um, all about giving. This is stuff we do every single day. Uh, and I have watched Schieffer series talk about China and talk about all sorts of things where I've been very confused in the audience, not knowing what they were talking about. So I'm not in any way insulting your intelligence, just that I know that you all have very important jobs doing other things. Um, just for context, we're talking about philanthropy as private monies given to the greater good. Um, and that 
in just in the U.S., two hundred and ninety <clears throat> billion dollars was given in two thousand and ten for charitable gifts. Um, of that, what might surprise you is ninety percent come almost ninety percent actually come from individuals. So you're going to hear us talking about institutional foundations, and we have them represented here today. But actually, it's individuals that make up most of the charitable giving. Corporations only represent 5% of charitable giving um, in general philanthropic circles, though when it comes to disasters, corporations certainly have a lot uh, of things to consider. Um, and play a very important role, even though they're not as much of a percentage of the giving. Um, and as far as, you know, other, other, most where the money goes, most of the money goes to religion, actually. Um, and that would make sense to know that people give to the things that are closest to them. Um, and religion is very close to people. And then health and human services follow probably right after that. Unfortunately, disaster giving doesn't really make the pie chart. In fact, grants from institutions were only about $175 million last year. Now, that does not include individuals. That's from institutions. So with that, it, I, it helps me kind of transition to my first panelist that I want to introduce, who is the president, the CEO of a very a, amazing new organization called the Center for Disaster Philanthropy, which aims to actually get more money into disaster giving. Um, she is an incredible woman and a dear friend who I have just has enjoyed working with um, from the Gates Foundation. And she handled Melinda <coughs> and Bill Gates' um, international grant making portfolio, their emergency relief portfolio, and as well as the Hilton Foundation's um, portfolio for many years. And she also consults currently with many um, other organizations through the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. On my left is Ed Kane, um, who, if you please read his bio, it's pretty outstanding. I will not um, read it. But Ed is the Vice President of Grant Programs for the Conrad and Hilton Foundation in Los Angeles. Um, it is an institutional private foundation, and I will tell you, has um, the unique distinction of actually having a professional person on staff just dedicated to disasters. They've given $25 million um, just in the last five years um, uh, uh, it, to disasters. And he has worked in the international space. He has advised President Carter on global development issues and worked with the UNDP. Um, he has incredible experience, and I can't wait to hear from him. And then to my far right is, I have to be very honest, my closest colleague. Well, like, I, this is a, this is a hard <coughs> introduction. Yeah. John Davis and I had the distinct pleasure of working together at the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. And the Baton Rouge Area Foundation is a community foundation that, when I tell you, is the New York Yankees. It's the BCS champion. It's a, he runs um, a very sophisticated $600 million shop down there in Baton Rouge and um, was, in my opinion, a Katrina hero, a leader and um, really showed how philanthropy can um, lead the way in disaster response and relief and recovery. And some of his work is the most outstanding that I have seen. And I'm so grateful that I get to learn from him all the time. So um, with that, I want to turn this over to my uh, panelists to give you some brief remarks. And then we're going to open it up for I'm going to ask some questions. We're just going to have a round robin talk, very casual. And then I'll open it up to you guys to ask some questions. And then we will head off to reception. So that's how this will work today. And um, I'm going to start with Regine. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you all for having me here. Um, I want to start off with some of the numbers, um, the disaster numbers, that is. So I apologize if these are familiar to all of, all of you all. 
I live in Nashville, so we say all of you all down there. Mm -hmm. um, it, so uh, in, two, in 2010, there were 385 disasters that affected more than 217 million people. They claimed 297,000 lives and caused an estimated $124 billion in damages. As you all know, in 2011, we have already had 10 $1 billion disasters with the economic total of those disasters coming in over $35 billion. So in, in every respect, the impact of disasters is on the rise. The number, the number of people affected, in fact, I'll, I'll chime in with another statistic that I know, which is that by 2015, predictions are saying that, or forecasts are, are saying that there will be 375 million people affected annually by disasters. So, so again, across every, Every stat you can get, these disasters are having an increased impact on, on our communities, on our, on our globe, on ourselves. Um, I have a, a real belief that the increased frequency and intensity of disasters creates an obligation for each one of us to become better informed and responsive on how we can help people around the world before, during, and after disasters. The center that I'm working to, to launch will, in my view, help to fulfill that obligation um, and only fulfill that obligation with the, the, the strong board, the strong advisory council, and the strong set of experts represented by you all here. Um, the center arose from the knowledge that there's significant opportunities to increase the effectiveness of the philanthropic response, both internationally and <coughs> domestically, just by providing a place for good, sound information analysis um, and just a resource to the philanthropic community. So from this kernel of an idea that there was an opportunity to provide that information and provide that resource, um, two visionaries, Eric Kessler and Lori Bertman, um, have really worked to build a permanent resource for the community that exists to change the face of emergency-related grant making. Um, we have the desire to move this emergency-related grant making from this reactive and human emotion-driven response to one that's really focused on increasing the effectiveness of the private dollar and with the aspirational goal of increasing the amount of total dollars raised for disasters. Again, all of this focused on the good of the affected community. Ed? Well, first let me say thank you for uh, having me. And Lori, I think this is a terrific initiative and um, making a real contribution to helping make philanthropy more smart in its grant making in this particular area. Maybe I'll just give you a little bit of background about the Hilton Foundation. Um, Conrad Hilton gave us a fairly simple and precise directive in terms of how he wanted to see his, his money used. Um, and it was simply to improve the lives of the disadvantaged <coughs> and the vulnerable. And that was without regard for race, religion, um, or uh, country of origin. Uh, Lori mentioned that we have given $25 million in grants to this particular uh, sector. Uh, we, we do have a grant program in a number of other areas, but this is one of our priorities. Um, but that $25 million actually was over the last 20 years, but in the last five years, about half of that amount has been given. And uh, I would just point out that it would be Katrina, the, the uh, tsunami, um, and most recently, uh, we're one of the major responders to the uh, disaster in the uh, Horn of Africa. Um, <clears throat> we've become more strategic over that period of time. Um, like many in philanthropy today, I think um, our practices were fairly simple, not guided by too many rules and regulations, codes, or principles. Um, the, the idea would be um, the board would want to respond uh, more often in an emotional way to a, to a disaster. And um, of course, the first candidate on the list was give it to the Red Cross. Um, and, and that is not to suggest that that is not a worthy cause, but um, over time we realized that um, as um, certain disasters or certain operators on the ground that are actually better in terms of um, making use of the money, and I think the most ex recent example of that would be uh, in Haiti where an institution like Partners in Health were in much better positioned to respond to that disaster. We've done a retrospective look at um, what this 20 years of uh, grant making has meant to, the, to um, what kind of impact we may have had and if we did no harm and actually did some good. Um, and we commissioned an independent study to give us that analysis. Uh, we're just finishing up on that study. We'll be posting it uh, on our website. 
the review has also taken a broader look at the role of philanthropy in disasters and drawing on the lessons learned from our grant making. Uh, and I think our lessons are rather significant because, uh, and I was talking to Regine earlier, there are not that many foundations actually that make this a priority. Uh, there's just a handful. Um, the analysis um, gave us a snapshot of what the current environment is. It was mentioned that I had in my previous lives working for the UN, a major non-governmental organization. <coughs> um, I'm pleased to say that the glass is half full. There has been progress, particularly in the official development assistance area where there's been greater alignment and harmonization and practices and response uh, resources like Relief Web to help guide um, the official grant makers. But as it was mentioned by Lori, um, that progress isn't equally um, practiced in the other silos. And I am speaking now after a few years in philanthropy, I can say that philanthropy has a way to go to catch up with some of these, these uh, more enlightened practices and, um, and, and principles that, that should be followed. Um, uh, we also learned, and, and no surprise, that there is a woeful lack of attention given to preparedness. Um, there is that emotional reaction to the, the crisis at hand, but um, interest dies off quite quickly after that, and, and recovery also isn't, isn't dealt with as much as it should be. And in the discussion today, I, I, I just think that we should, again, drawing on our own experience and, and, and what our analysis uh, came up with, there's a few areas that I, I I think it would be worthy of further discussion among the panelists and perhaps yourselves. One is the whole issue of um, when we speak of codes, principles, best practices, be it the Red Cross, Red Crest, and NGO code of conduct or the SPHERE guidelines, um, do, are we obligated, if not to conform to them, to at least be aware of them before we embark on our well-intended philanthropy? Um, accountability having some measure of, of, of um, looking at what exactly did we do no harm, and, and if we did do good, what good did we do? Capacity building. The much neglected area of building capacity of really the front line for coordination and alignment of activities, and those are the in-country actors, principally the government, but other civil society actors, and not to superimpose some imported type of um, of operation that, that doesn't build that capacity where it really needs to be built. Um, and that, of course, leads to the whole issue of coordination and, and better collaboration. And then finally, communicating our experience and knowledge in a, in a very transparent way. What have we learned? Where have we made mistakes? And where have we had an impact? I love when the panelist does my job for me. This is fabulous. <coughs> OK, <laughs> John. Thank you, Lori. Um, I guess I speak for the. Uh, the regional or local funders, these folks are international experts and have great experience beyond our borders. One of the issues that we, we came to grips with pretty quickly is that this field is undefined. We really don't know much about how we should be going about. There are no constructs for, for how we should be preparing to respond to disasters, not really. Um, what, what we found through our experience is that really there are multiple scenarios and each scenario Evol develops a different response. So, for example, in the United States, you have the American Red Cross on point for, for major catastrophic disasters. Other regional, other national NGOs come play in their space pretty hard, like the Salvation Army and others. Uh, and then the local NGOs kind of fill the gaps. And if there isn't a relationship with large funders, the local NGOs who can be pretty powerful don't have much traction to, to, <coughs> to, do the ro to play the roles they have to play particularly in catastrophic, catastrophic situations. And sometimes the gaps are big. For example, breaking, breaking Laurie's rule, and she knew I would, uh, during Katrina, in terms of relief, the relief end of the, if we, you four-phase the whole response to these disasters, if there are four phases to it, relief being the second, rescue being the first, um, during the relief phase, we took care of through primarily faith-based groups, as many folks as the Red Cross did in our, in our catchment area which was 25,000 kind of at a time in shelters and such. And we were the sole funder. And so it was a real problem because FEMA never got around to reimbursing those churches. And when other disasters happened, the next time around, they were much less likely to come up and, and help. So many fell off the wagon and didn't, in fact, come play the roles they had played so nobly and effectively uh, during that major event. Outside the US, it seems to me that the disaster response is much better managed. The NGOs 
are used to playing together. They play much more effectively. They know how to, how to do it. The, IR, the International Rescue Committee came to Baton Rouge to help us get organized post-Katrina, and they, they, they couldn't get all the cogs plugged in. Now, you know, it was a catastrophic disaster, so we understand that, but even the, the IRC had great difficulty trying to get that space organized among the bigger players, not the smaller players like us. Um, so the inter we, we feel the international place space is really well managed by the large NGOs, although how, sm how the small NGOs, the local guys play, is equally less defined, I think, and probably a real opportunity to improve our response. Um, then you get back to the U.S. and you have other issues. You have major d events like the Deepwater Horizon event, uh, where the Stafford Act is not, um, is not uh, invoked, and so you don't have uh, options to deal with FEMA and you know, the, the big players to come help out. And what I would tell you is if we hadn't been through uh, some of the challenges that we had before with Katrina and Rita, um, we would have been hard-pressed to organize ourselves locally and deal with the, na the national guys who came in to help us to find a good response mechanism to the challenges that some of our communities along the coast faced as a result of that, of that event. Uh, finally, just as an observation, nothing substitutes for experience. Um, uh, if a community has had a major disaster and has, learned, has responded to it, it will respond, respond way better the next time, and there's no way to impose that training. Now, I say all this because in order to know how we prepare for major disasters, we have to have to understand what the options are and what the playbook looks like once the disaster hits. Thank you. Great, um, great comments. Um, one question that just kind of stemmed from just something you just said. Uh, what, in your estimation, what do philanthropists need to know about the Stafford Act and the uh, National Disaster Recovery Framework? Um, that's come up, and the sphere standards. I mean, what, what type of education is important for the, um, the philanthropists to be better grant makers? Well, <clears throat> as I said, there's been tremendous progress in terms of developing codes of conduct and, and best practices, and this is all well documented in terms of the Red Cross, Red Crescent, NGO Code of Conduct, the Sphere Guidelines. Um, and I was told not to talk in UN speak, and, but I'm afraid these are the way they're, they're, they're described. So just take, I try. Take a note. <laughs> but um, we have made it a precondition in our grant making as we've more, moved to more strategic grant making in this area that, that our grantees um, confirm to us that they are um, conforming to those guidelines and, and codes. Um, so we, we think this is, um, and, it, and you know, it, and, and coordination mechanisms, uh, we always ask to what extent the, uh, what is their, um, um, who are they aligning themselves with? We of course assess the situation if you have a, a tragedy like we saw in, in Haiti where the, the very, the federal structure was totally decimated, you know, what kind of surrogate arrangement has been developed that you as a, as a, as a responder are going to be aligning yourself or aligning yourself with? And these are, these are just fundamental questions I think that have to be asked and, and, and um, sometimes aren't. I would add to that that um, I don't think it's as much issues about the legal s status. I mean, if FEMA shows up, people know. Um, <laughs> that's intended to be a joke. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but more that um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we understand is in disaster, communications break down completely. And there is no reliable communication in, in, in times of, 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 uh, of significant disasters. And that translates to, coming to information coming out to the donor community and people who care and want to make a difference and want to support financially what they see. You know, the <coughs> people popping out of the rooftops, the, you know, the Japanese folks around the, 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 the nuclear plants, et cetera, they want to respond to what they see on TV, and they don't know how to respond. They know they can write, you know, they can support the big national NGOs, they can support Paul Farmer in Haiti, but they don't know who the local guys are who can make a difference on the ground and who are going to be there after, the, after mm -hmm. the, the national folks, the international rescue folks are gone, and who are really part of the, the whole long-term recovery uh, picture. Any 
Anything the, to add to that? The only thing I would add is, is um, having been a grant maker, for me, those codes and the sphere standards and the good enough guide, they, I, I would look for anything I could to get me closer to the ground from, from wherever my office was at the time. So anything that would give me a closer window on how this grantee or potential grantee was going to be acting. And so for me, that was a, a critical lifeline since I wasn't on the ground and yet deeply wanted to support the relief effort, efforts. And so that brings me to kind of a question about speed kind of versus deliberation. I mean, obviously, um, the government sometimes is slow to come in um, to relief and recovery um, and kind of quick to end their funding of recovery. Um, we've seen that. Um, we've experienced that in uh, Louisiana. I know John's nodding his head. Um, what, what is the role of philanthropy um, when the government leaves? And, 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 and John, I'm going to throw that at you because um, I know that you've jumped in on many and many occasions. Well, the problem is, and it goes right to the to the subject matter of this of this session is, is that um, is that re the recovery process is a very long one. Um, it's extraordinarily long. So for years we had essentially in, in internment camps of of, uh, of folks who who had, had <coughs> evacuated from New Orleans in right at, in our in our own county in East Baton Rouge Parish. We have parishes rather than counties. Um, and um, and it, it was very, I think, um, I thought sarcastically called Renaissance Village first, but that was really the name um, of a place that had 2,500 people living in there, there. And most of them were moms with kids in teeny tiny trailers. You all probably seen all that. But they lived, lived there for years and they lived behind, you know, razor wire and with, with, uh, with, um, with National Guard, with M16s at the gate, um, checking credentials so you could come in. Again, protecting the population, but it didn't feel like that. If, if you all saw that, it didn't feel like that. And the problem is that by that point, we're kind of three years out and, you know, we've moved on. Um, and there still are huge, huge issues around how you deal with these populations. And these are the most, these are the folks who are at the, the very end of the, uh, the most challenged in terms of where they live in, in society who have the least opportunities and who are going to be the hardest to replace in society. Uh, and they end up remaining in these camps the longest with, with no hope, really. And there is a huge connection, in my view, uh, between, between the capacity to, to reintegrate people into community um, and the timeline it takes to do that. The longer we delay in reintroducing people to community, the more pathological <coughs> the problems are that they're going to face. And so that takes money. I mean, we're one of the few funders who funded projects in, in, Renaissance, in Renaissance Village because by that point, you know, everybody had logically moved on. Fortunately, the, com the country, the world, was very generous to, to Louisiana, exceedingly generous. And so we had resources to, to address that. But that is, in fact, the whole purpose, I think, of, of the effort that you and Regine are trying to, to get started, and that is to be a lot more purposeful, thoughtful, and it kind of intellectualize this so that you have the most rational response to a long-term challenge. Would you like to add? Well, you, you mentioned where philanthropy has some uh, unique um, capabilities that perhaps more slower-moving governments might have. And, I, and we give you, I can give you an example of what we've developed in the Hilton Foundation on the, the idea of being innovative, flexible, and quick. Um, our board meets every quarter, and it became very obvious to us that you don't wait three months if a disaster strikes and your board's not going to meet for another three months. So we set up a chairman's and president's um, quick response fund, um, totaling a half a million dollars. And uh, this is simply in working with our staff, the president, Steve Hilton, and his father, Baron Hilton, um, both of whom are extremely... Um, uh, responsive to disaster situations, as is our board in general. Um, and uh, we've, we've been able to get money right out the door within a couple of days of a disaster. And we, and we try to target those types of things that, um, that are in need immediately of, of, of some assistance. At the same time, we, don't, we keep our powder dry to, to some extent. If we see a, a disaster of a certain magnitude, like Katrina, 
we recognize that the neglected area of recovery has to be also addressed. So in addition to the, the rapid response, we um, engage with local actors on the ground. I think, John, you can attest to this. Absolutely. Um, where we um, looked at local consultants uh, in Louisiana and said, um, and there's a lot of pressure sometimes from board members, we, you know, because there's a relationship with a particular school or um, um, that, that they, they, that has a problem. The basketball court got flooded and they need to put new wood down. But there are more fundamental issues facing that community. And our board said, okay, let's not react in that way. Let's, let's learn from those on the ground what the priorities are. And, and um, so our recovery grant making in the Katrina context was very much driven by local actors. Um, while we gave some to the relief, we recognized that we had to um, have a more deliberative and a longer range process of identifying what other needs we could address in the longer term. Regine, how, how do you get um, the philanthropist to start thinking about recovery from relief? As we, we know, um, that emotionally dri driven response is just never going away. I mean, that's something that is uh, part of human behavior, and it's a very cathartic for people to, to give um, that way. Um, how do you start to, to move them to start seeing recovery in, in the same way and an important investment? I mean, I think it's a steady, steady process, right? And I actually, I, I see two of you in the audience, and I'll be nice and not make you raise your hand, that have written papers that talk about the critical need for philanthropists to pay attention to preparedness and recovery. Um, and so I think it's about, it's about taking where our, our, commu our respective community is now, and I don't know if it's a slow but steady or a deluge. It was, it was either you can take the slow and steady approach or the deluge approach with information and showing how year over year, you know, a, a, a penny, what's the, what's the saying? A, a, a pound of cure is a penny of a cure is worth a pound of prevention. A penny of prevention is worth a pound of, pound of cure. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, audience, can we get some help on this? I know, exactly. I know, really. <laughs> My phone will chime in any time, really. A we should have rehearsed that. Right. that exactly. Was. Anyway, my point being, right, we know that a dollar, of, a dollar for pen, prevention um, saves somewhere between four and eleven dollars in relief, and that's depending upon the study that you look at. So there's mm -hmm. there's evidence out there, and we can look at the situations today where we're well past a year following a disaster. I mean. Pick one. Even, I'll just say it again, Nashville, right? Um, we can look at Nashville, we can look at Haiti, and we're year out, year plus out of an emergency. New Orleans, year plus out of an emergency, you're still seeing very critical shelter, health care, um, child care, infrastructure needs that are unmet, and there's a, a real, obviously, I feel passionate about this, there's a real need for our private donor community to to sustain their attention over time. Keep your powder dry. <laughs> Keep your powder dry. Well, with this groundswell of disasters this year, I mean, has it, re has it really translated into an upticking of grant making, or have you all seen some donor fatigue? I'm gonna throw that throw out. out. Gonna, okay, I have not seen donor fatigue. What I have seen uh, you know, to use your word uptick, I have seen an uptick in the philanthropic community, um, a desire <coughs> to make sure that every dollar awarded, be it from an individual to a family foundation to an institutional foundation, that every dollar award, uh, awarded um, is, is hardwired for maximum impact. And that's, that's what I'll say. Well, and speaking just from our personal experience, as I've indicated, the trend has been upward in terms of our board's response. Uh, maybe more disasters, but um, th when I say the, the, the 500,000 quick response, that's per disaster. So potentially if there were three disasters in a given year, um, and not to say we would respond to every single disaster, but there is um, a uh, considerable amount of um, compassion by our board. To, mm -hmm. to, and I think it's very much driven by the knowledge, and this is the important point I should make, that the money that we are giving is going to good organizations that are following good practices 
and who can account for what, uh, how the money was spent. And now, not to say there isn't room for improvement, but um, I think we were a little bit in the fog in the past, but now we have a, a much, I think the board, um, like many of our other programmatic areas, feels more confident and as a result is prepared to be more generous. And I would say that would probably be, encourage others to be generous as well. But I think there's one other observation. Because <coughs> we receive, we're a, we're a vehicle for philanthropy. Right? People send us money for specific uses. And so when, when particularly Louisiana has had a bunch of wonderful misadventures here recently, uh, what we have seen is, is giving has become much more international. So for example, in response to, to um, to Deepwater Horizon, I think we had something like 15 or 20 gifts from, from Norway. Now, don't ask me why, but we, we had a lot more international gifts coming in. S so I, I think folks, I think we have embraced the fact that we're a global village. We see that with our donor population giving to things that happen outside of Louisiana. Our donor population responds to virtually every major event that happens. Now, maybe because we live in Louisiana and we've been on the sharp end of that, of that stick, but but it's true that, 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 w that our donors are responsive. And then national and international folks are, have been very responsive to challenges that they see uh, uh, per, uh, facing us in these, international, in these, uh, in these disaster incidents. Um, I've, so I've barrage, so many questions I want to barrage you with. But I, I just want to follow that with something you were <coughs> talking about earlier, comparing kind of the international community and the, um, and the US. Uh, grant making community. Can you expound on that audience? Well, I, I see a couple of familiar faces out in the audience from my days in the international community. And as I said, I think there's been extraordinary work done to better align official development assistance, otherwise known as ODA, um, multilateral assistance, getting the UN a bit more coordinated. Not easy herding cats, but it can be done. Um, and what struck, strikes me is that. Correspondingly, when you saw disasters like Katrina um, and, and the lack of coordination and alignment, um, that uh, some of those practices and principles didn't, and I, and I recall one example, and I'm a bit reluctant to point it out, but someone made the point that the International Red Cross and how it managed its affairs versus the American Red Cross, that there could be a lot to be learned by the, the, the US versus the international. So, there needs to be a dialogue. Um, we are not, uh, we have tr tremendous skills in this country in terms of our logistics. I've seen the US military operate in certain disaster situations. I think they're second to none. Um, but we, we need to be able to bring the different silos together and, and, and build on each other's knowledge and, and, and best practices. And, and I, I think that dialogue is beginning. Um, as we've been discussing, we're, this is a global challenge. It's not just here in the U.S. And, um, and, and I, 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 uh, there's a lot that's been done on the international stage that I think could be learned by how we, we deal here in the United States with disasters. That's great. And um, back to kind of uh, accountability. Um, obviously, this being such a new field, you mentioned a little bit about the metrics that you kind of use to um, fund Organ, uh, fund organizations, but how, how do you choose which disaster to respond to? I mean, we, there's disasters there's every week, it seems. How, you know, how do grant makers, what metrics do grant makers need to use to, to respond to disasters, and then to also evaluate their impact? Well, um, Stepping back at our grant making as a whole, we, we, we give about $100 million away a year. And most of those are in strategic program areas like homelessness in the, at Los Angeles County, safe water in sub-Saharan Africa. And we've earmarked a certain amount of money for those, for those efforts. Um, we do keep some money in reserve anticipating disasters, but it's certainly not in the order of 5 to $10 million. Um, so it's, it's a bit serendipitous, if I could mm -hmm. be honest. Um, depending on the stock market, um, you find yourself um, at a certain point in your, your payout year where you may have um, more in your coffers than you had expected. And um, not to make light of it, but if a disaster happens to fall in that, at a particular time when you have that, that resource, 
you're, you are inclined to be more, more generous, frankly. Um, in a, a leaner year, when you're really on target with your program delivery in your strategic areas, um, there is some money kept for disasters, but it, it, it would be much less in, in those, those situations. I've got my cue from Commander um, Nelson in the back <laughs> that says that it's time to maybe open up questions to the audience. Um, I have a bunch more questions for this group, but I'm going to um, offer you all the opportunity to ask some questions. And I'm going to start with, I saw your hand first. So you're first. Yes, uh, my name is Joel Charney from Interaction. Um, first, thanks. Uh, this panel has been excellent. Really high value, very succinct, really great, very interesting. Um, two quick things. One is on, on um, the whole question of hooking up with local organizations in an emergency internationally. My suggestion would be that there has to be some intentionality around that. In other words, it can't be something that's done in the immediate aftermath of a large-scale emergency. There's got to be some thoughts, some planning, you know, whether it's done on a regional basis or whether it's done on a country basis or thematic. It's kind of, my advice would be, from a philanthropic perspective, it's got to be something that you're thinking about year-round because scrambling around at the last minute in the immediate <laughs> aftermath of an emergency to find the right local institution is, is practically impossible. Um, my, my second comment is to raise something that hasn't come up, with, come up yet, which is the whole question of advocacy. I've spent most of my career doing what I would call humanitarian advocacy. And there is a role I don't know if it's 1 to 10 or 1 to 20, but there can be plenty of money for the response, but the response can still be incredibly confused, have gaps, and so on. And there really is a role for kind of the outsider who doesn't have an operational stake in the game, who's looking at the situation and saying, now wait a second, there's this community that you're missing. Or with this money, maybe it's better to do X, Y, or Z. And I'm seeing a huge diminution in the number of foundations and the amount of money that's available for what I would call humanitarian advocacy. And I'm wondering if you see, if, you're, if you agree that that's a trend, if you're concerned about it, and what comment you might have on, on the role of advocacy as opposed to operations. Well, I'd start with amen um, on yeah, everything you amen. said, yeah. and, uh, and I do think that the advocacy role is a critical one. Um, it goes back to that whole, my little vignette about communications and the, f the incoherence of communications in times of disaster. Someone needs to be translating that so that people can understand, can kind of figure out what's going on, uh, and, and to argue the case so that, so that, so that um, so that there is a response, and the response is consistent and continued until the solutions are, are in place. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I don't know exactly how that works, but has it, has it backed down? I would say you're right, that it, that, you know, it seems to me that, you, that you're absolutely right about that. And I just want to make a point about John, and, and John has, you know, certainly <coughs> philanthropy can serve a role as a convener um, and to really get messages um, from underserved communities up into the uh, government and to change policy, and it has been done. Um, and I think there probably needs to be more of that. And uh, I think uh, the Baton Rouge Area Foundation has, uh, has done quite a bit of work in that area. Uh, so I just wanted to just J just, just a quick point. I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more on, on your, both of your points, but on, on the right local institution and the, the role of philanthropy, I, I think that the problem I would see um, uh, is that, uh, again, back to the silos and, and who should be doing what. I, I can see a role for national authorities, firstly and foremost, to be looking at these issues, um, and national civil societies, but obviously they don't always have the resources and ability to do that. 
then you can look at the um, official development assistance to trying to oh, deal yeah, with yeah, yeah. that particular problem of having yeah. capacity before a disaster versus after it. But when you, um, because philanthropy doesn't have that broader reach in terms of all the potential disasters that might be out there. And, but a uh, point well taken that we shouldn't be scrambling looking for the local actor at, after the fact. It should be before the fact. But I would hope that by sharing information and, and these different silos being more uh, in alignment, um, philanthropy could be informed by others that have helped in that regard so that we'd make the right choices. Um, Erwin, in the back, do you have your hand up? I did, kind of, <laughs> I did. Uh, I want to I make a couple of points and then uh, some, some thoughts about, uh, about the role of philanthropy. And the first thing is that I don't think we should brush over the, the statement that we're, we have lessons learned effectively. We don't actually do lessons learned very well. Mm -hmm. And in 1985 in Ethiopia, when uh, the country was flooded with humanitarian relief and aid, it overwhelmed any possibility of a rapid recovery of the local agricultural economy there. We continue to do this over and over again all over the world. We, we, we send stuff without any regard for the impact of the stuff on the ability of those communities to recover. So not only don't we don't we learn it, we keep uh, repeating the same sort of mistakes with the same consequences around recoveries, first thing. Second thing, there's, there's many, many lessons that have never even been taught. For example, how do you really take care of vulnerable populations in communities either domestically or internationally? A lot of those problems and the vulnerability has to do with pre-existing conditions that really predated the disaster. So is the advocacy really around uh, fixing vulnerability issues, improving resiliency before the disaster ever happens, which means are we expecting people to advocate around the, end, the ending of poverty, for instance, which wouldn't be a bad idea, but you know, we have to sort of define what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We just saw in Japan, uh, very recently, in, in northeastern Japan with the uh, earthquake, the tsunami, then the uh, nuclear uh, catastrophic event, that even in Japan, which is probably the most prepared country in the world, especially around earthquakes and tsunamis, that there was really some serious failures in how vulnerable populations were cared for. It was cold, the shelters weren't adequate, medications uh, and the supply chain uh, <coughs> was not working properly. Lots and lots of compounded issues, which I would have expected all of us in the world to have known, and especially Japan. And the third thing is the recovery point is really the stepchild of, of everything to do with disasters. We, it's gotten the least attention, it's been very poorly handled. It, it's really uh, its own real problem. If you look at the mega disasters that have taken place over the last 20 years, the really large disasters, uh, the record of recovering from those disasters is really very spotty and very poor. And there's a lot that we need to know, if, starting with the fact that we always define, we've had defined or acted as if we defined recovery by how quickly are we going to rebuild the houses, the structures, the infrastructure, as opposed to our families and communities back to some state of normalcy. And in the case of those communities that were very deprived and disadvantaged beforehand, we want better than normalcy, normalcy <coughs> the, the normalcy they experienced prior to the disaster. Very complicated, but I think there's some good news on the horizon there in terms of uh, the National uh, Disaster Recovery Framework and so forth. So maybe there'll be more attention. But this leads me to uh, want to make just two quick comments about the role of private philanthropy, which as far as I'm concerned, has to be around innovating and creativity, setting standards, advocacy, and all these other things, because those are things that government does not do very well and can't do very well. <coughs> what government does is, uh, is do large-scale interventions if they have the money to, to do it. You know, 250,000 uh, homes were destroyed in, uh, in Katrina. Habitat for Humanity, a wonderful organization, built 900, 1,000 homes. Brad Pitt built 65, 11 of them, 11 of them vacant as of this morning. Mm -hmm. um, those are nice efforts, and they're good for the families that go there. And by the way, those Brad Pitt homes, you can't get up the stairs. So, it's, so if senior <laughs> citizens live there, I can't even use those houses. So there's things that we need to do. And the final point I want to make about this is that we have to make sure that the philanthropic community stops demonizing what they call research. Research right. is evidence, it's data, it's, it's information, yes. information that should drive policy. Otherwise, we keep doing random acts of preparedness that don't necessarily, <laughs> acts of uh, don't necessarily foster good outcomes, right. number one. And number two, 
what happens in the absence of data is there's no way, as, uh, as A.K. was pointing out earlier, how do we get accountability if we don't have information and data? Accountability and good policy are exclusively derived from data. You want to call it research? You want to call it going to the zoo? Whatever you call it, <laughs> we've got to have the information. And that's where partnerships with the people that know how to do that need to flourish. And there's a, a specific area where I think private philanthropy could fill in some major gaps that are not covered currently by government. Um, I just want to point out, um, Erwin Redlener is uh, the, from Columbia University and the president of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness and has done extraordinary work in Louisiana. Um, we know him very well and we have collaborated with him on many different ventures and our latest one um, along with CDP is um, to analyze these policies that are coming out and, uh, in the disaster uh, um, recovery um, framework as well as the Stafford Act and really understand what our place is in philanthropy as well as understanding the best way to help um, communities recover faster and return to normalcy and so um, we have worked with Irwin for many years and I will tell you Irwin is that guy that is uh, on the ground whether the funding's there or not he is there and he has Never left, <laughs> but we like to get them the funding. So, um, so yes, we, we understand that about research. Very good points. Your hand's been up, and you've been oh, and then you definitely. But I'm talking uh, this first gentleman right here. Uh, I'm Dr. Widner. I come from New Orleans, and I was the first MD or PhD at the Department of Homeland Security headquarters, working directly for Mike Chertoff during Hurricane Katrina. That being said, I also served in Just Cause in Panama, Kuwait City, and the Northern Iraq Relief Operations, Mogadishu, Somalia, Haiti, and um, uh, up in U Uganda as well. And um, in Mogadishu, we set up a civil military operations center which was a coordination center of all non-government organizations, all humanitarian relief organizations. And I drafted the plan, much like the plans, models that I did for Panama, much like I did for uh, Kuwait and, Ir and Iraq and Kirk, which gave us a model from the inception of the idea, conception of the idea, to the final end state and where the mitigation measures, both nouns and verbs, when you plug them in, what were, what were going to be the resultant outcomes. That's important because, according to Clausewitz, no man or no man in his right mind starts a war unless he knows what it is he wants to achieve and how he wants to achieve it. The nouns of, a mit of a mitigation measures, most importantly, is money. But unfortunately, unless you know where that money is going to be in place in that cycle or sequence of events, it becomes squandered, as the gentleman in the back just pointed out. In order to effectively do this, you have to have run tabletop exercises with the community before you start actually executing and implementing what it is you're trying to do. If you can't do that, then you're dealing with a lot of people that are dealing with chaos because, as he pointed out, you're dealing with sporadic, chaotic implementation of these measures, and then the verbs that you're trying to implement in your mitigation measures fail. Thank you for the statement. Do you have a question, right? Yes, nice. Patient woman in the rust, pretty. Sure. Hi, my name is Diane McEachran. <laughs> I work with a company called Big Green Purse, and we educate consumers about marketplace choices that protect human health and the environment. Brad Pitt aside, it seems like uh, there is a tremendous opportunity, if this can be said without sounding callous, for the recovery effort to take to make great strides in environmental protection 
with all the rebuilding that is going on, the simplest things, light bulbs, insulation in homes, and so on, there's just a tremendous opportunity to work in these communities to create a higher environmental standard than existed before. And I'm wondering to what degree you see yourselves considering <coughs> that or you see others in the philanthropy community realizing that it's not just, you know, we saw this with the FEMA trailers, get them up as, as quickly as possible and they turned out to be a human health and environmental nightmare themselves. Right. So I'd be really curious to see what the philanthropy community is thinking about in terms of the environmental component of the recovery effort. Mm -hmm. John, could you take that? I, I, unfortunately, I don't see that as being a, a huge uh, piece of the, of the consideration as, as we rebuild. I, I really don't. We're involved in rebuilding one of the uh, HUD housing projects in New Orleans, our foundation is. And we've done a great job. We focused on the social e efforts because we were so offended by the, by the concentration of poverty and the humiliation of seeing you know, this concentration of poverty popping out of rooftops on TVs. It was just, it was deeply humiliating to those of us who live there. And we swore that wouldn't happen again. So we've been involved in rebuilding uh, the St. Bernard Housing Project. And it is indeed, it's turned into a model. But I'm, I'm horrified to tell you that I think we have been insensitive to, the, to, the, uh, to those environmental issues that in fact would have been very easy to implement. We're part of a partnership, so I don't solely take the blame for not having thought that through, but we should have. <laughs> we should have thought that through because it, it's very easy to do, to make very small steps that have made a very big difference. And I don't think, unfortunately, we're alone in that. So we need to be attentive to that and, and raise that flag. Um, somewhere right there. Yes. Question? Statement? Right there. Uh, Chris Brahini, independent consultant. Um, I've heard a number of speakers talk about the need. We're, we're good at pushing food, band-aids, whatever, out, but we don't necessarily we don't want to hold it up. We don't necessarily know where it's needed when. Sounds like the uh, problem is, you know, granularity, speed, and granularity of information. And one of the greatest technological revolutions sweeping the planet in both developed and undeveloped countries is cell phones. They have unique identifiers. What I think is missing maybe, and maybe the philanthrop uh, organizations can work with uh, folks like Apple, Google, mm -hmm. Microsoft, to develop a standard application that would be free for people to have on every, every phone. And think of it sort of as like a global individual uh, uh, person, uh, life alert or disaster, individual disaster alert system that could provide two things, what your status is, or for those in your group, injured, dead, you know, lost, trapped, and what your need is, food, water, medical, whatever, in a standard format, you hit the activate button and it would go out over whatever means, by text or web or cell, and it would, and, and you wouldn't have the double counting problem because every need would be tagged to a specific number. So maybe that would help solve some of the problem on where things were needed and avoid overcounting, double counting, whatever. There's a lot of people in that space try, trying to figure that very thing out. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes cell phones don't work in the middle of a disaster. <laughs> sometimes, uh, go ahead. That's a good point. Um, oh, we're right here, right up front. Yep, you've had your hand up. Question. Uh, good evening, Alejandro Guzman from the Organization of American States. As uh, I think you've all posed very, very adequately tonight, one of uh, the greatest emphasis during uh, philanthropic giving and disaster situations is focused in the face of the actual disaster and possibly even a little bit more in the recovery. But one of the faces that is com almost completely isolated is the face of disaster risk management and disaster risk reduction. We're talking about preparedness and the previous faces. And although in the international community we've seen great advances towards this with, for example, the adoption of the Yogo framework of action, um, how do you all see the possible integration or possible impact of the philanthropic community um, to create local and community uh, resilience for, in order to prevent or in order to reduce disaster, and disaster impacts? I have a short, short answer, which is to say I think there's a lot of discussion around DRR and around increasing community resilience and 
and there are some small steps that have been you know taken there you know I, I can list several grants large initiatives that have been launched um, but but I would say that I would say I'd like to see that discussion move into more action and that's my short answer. Well, you know I, I come back to, uh, I was looking at this disaster recovery framework that's recently was about a year old now when was it first produced the US it started about and a year ago. Um, it's, it's it's a very detailed document and it's it educates us on the continuum and the importance of, and then of preparedness as well as recovery um, but you know this has been talked about for 20 years and I, I come back to the international community the whole concept of the continuum and risk reduction mitigation and preparedness um, it's a willingness to do it and, and it does come back to some root cause issues as poverty and, and unfortunately you start to unwind the ball of string you're going to find your you're going to get yourself into some much more messy kinds of situations to address than what makes you feel good when you throw a couple of pallets of high protein biscuits and some plastic sheeting on the tarmac of an airport and and we've just got to get real about that that and it's and, and, and I think if in the role of philanthropy again you have to keep in mind the resources, uh, ultimate, the fundamental resources are going to come from the countries themselves. Then you're going to have the multilateral official development assistance, bilateral. Philanthropy in that overall context is not that large, but we could play a catalytic role in reigniting awareness in the importance of this and why it's a much bigger bang for the buck. And that, um, and, and, but the problem again is philanthropy is in the very nascent stages of getting on board with all of these concepts and there's only a few major foundations that are really addressing disasters in any form let alone the preparedness side but it it's something that I think gets back to the advocacy issue mm -hmm. but the answers are out there it's just doing it do we we have a lot of questions out here do we have some time for a couple more questions my timekeepers who are okay we do thank, thank you commander um, you right there that's you. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi, I'm uh, Lindsay Holman. I'm from Wood Associates. Um, I wanted to ask you a question regarding economic recovery. Um, as you know, as you said earlier, the economic impact of disasters is uh, substantial. Um, and as of right now, there is currently very little to actually no real um, economic recovery assistance um, on, the, on the federal side. Um, and there are a dime a dozen organizations out there that want to do the bricks and mortar, the, the, uh, the warm your heart projects, building houses, building back public services and schools. However, you have to have jobs for these people to go back to in order for them to occupy these things. Um, so what is your organization's ideas on enhancing holistic economic recovery from maybe getting more financial institutions to take part um, and actually getting some of these things done in terms of planning financial recovery for an area outside of just reimbursing for public services? Good question. John? So one of the things that, that we are engaged in <coughs> is trying to, uh, uh, thanks to, to a grant we have from BP, is to try to train folk, retrain people so that they don't have to so that they can work in different places. I mean, what we're dealing with is very fragile coastal communities, and, and Erwin knows them well because he's been doing some great work down there, but, but very fragile um, coastal communities that are mostly, um, that, that, are, that are populations that have always lived off the water, and their long-term trajectory is pretty grim. And one of the things that we've done is to find retraining opportunities for them that will allow them to do other things because these are generations that have lived off the, off the water pretty much and in in the face of the realities of living in a deltaic community or in a delta which it has lost six inches over the last ten years to net water rise uh, four of those from subsidence to from net, from water rise the projection that trajectory gets worse and so the long term is pretty grim we are engaged in trying to find alternative training opportunities for those folks so that they have an option to do something other than that, the only thing they know to do, which is to fish or to be oystermen or shrimpers, et cetera. Well, you know, on that, that's a very important point, and thank you for raising it. Um, 
I'm probably not going to articulate this very well, and there may be someone else in the audience that knows more details about this, but if you look at the Horn of Africa situation, you've got the Somalis that have come into northern Kenya, but you also have the ethnic Somalis from Kenya. And the dilemma is that those ethnic Somalis are not eligible to go into those refugee camps. And yet, in many respects, they're suffering the same kind of impact as the others in terms of the drought, or they're very much on the edge. So there, there have been some non-governmental organizations that have come to us, actually, and, and told us that this, there is an opportunity to sustain and reinvigorate livelihoods. Uh, some are being exploited in terms of the marketing of their livestock because they don't know what the ultimate market price is. And, and it gets back to the telephone and, and cell phone technology. So there's some talk about how do you eliminate the exploitive middleman on that, in that regard. Um, so it, it's, it's, def, it's definitely a type of intervention that's desperately needed. There are ideas out there, and, and, and we're very sensitive to, to seeing if there's something we might be able to do in that regard. Good point. Back there. Thank you. My name is Daniel Lamotte. I'm with the National Organization for the Investment of Haitians. And uh, I wanted to find out, uh, my question is, do you, um, how often do you, does your, do your organization partner with other philanthropies uh, or syndicate projects when they're too big for you or that you want to um, section off certain portions uh, to other groups? Thank you. You take it. <laughs> <laughs> they all just looked at the moderator and said, you take it. So I'm not just being the talking <laughs> moderator. Um, actually, probably the best example I can give you about that. Um, you know, we talk about this cross-collaboration, but really, um, I think it's very important for, for um, different uh, private, private, private foundations, community foundations, institutional foundations, and individuals to um, work together. And the best example I can give you is our Katrina example. Um, we. Uh, all band together in their, all the philanthropists of Baton Rouge band together um, and raised uh, within an hour $5 million. And um, this was corporate philanthropists, all different uh, private philanthropists, and um, were able to leverage it to close to a $60 million fund. So there is something to be said for all of us working together. And I will tell you that there is probably every disaster project that I work on, I usually collaborate with John on um, and vice versa. And um, he's the first person I call. And now I can't wait to, now that I have this great relationship with Ed, um, <laughs> I'll be calling Ed. And um, you know that's why we have created the Center for Disaster Philanthropy, to create a, an international recovery fund where Donors can all pull money together and um, leverage each other's money to have a greater impact um, in general. So it's a very good question, a very good point. Well, I can just give you a quick answer on how we do it. Um, our foundation board virtually insists, unless it's a unique area of research or innovation where you need to be kind of a venture philanthropist and go it on your own. And we've done that on occasion as well. But typically, our grants are always leveraged. Uh, the board wants to see that there's other buy-in. They want to see it scaled up in terms. And in fact, it was in New Orleans that we contributed to these these joint efforts with respect to Katrina. But um, it's 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 a it's a grant-making principle for us to go out, and it and it makes a little more work for the program officer to and and Regine it has worked with us in the past with her networks among others to say these are other foundations that are doing this, and if you were to add this, we could have a much um, bigger effect. So, but there needs to be more of this done. And, and I'm a big advocate of affinity groups within philanthropy. And, and I would like to see this particular sector of philanthropy grow in terms of more networking and more leveraging than we're seeing today. Do you want to talk about a community? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. okay. Um, right there. Right there. Front row. Front row. That's you. <laughs> I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent are you able to use the internet to get together these various funder groups 
and uh, get a consensus of what they want to do and what are the major emphases? I'm going to let Regine take that because uh, <laughs> I just looked at her and told her to talk about that. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, it's a good it's a good question. So I uh, we. You know, my research shows that funders absolutely want to know what other funders are doing. They are craving that information. And when I sat in a funder chair, you'd pick up the phone and you'd call, you'd call the next funder over and say, okay, hey, this is what we're thinking about, this is what we're talking about, this is how it fits with us, what are you all doing, right? And so you did that at this informal level. And it was critically important to me and my work. And we're trying to, what's the word, not replicate, but replicate and, and grow that through the center because we think that you know we talked about the fact that there's not that many foundations or you know small medium large foundations that have a dedicated staff person but there's but there might be one staff person here who is dedicated 10 percent of their time or there might be a family philanthropist who doesn't have staff but is is dying for some interaction with some other funders. And so we really we're gonna grow a community of disaster grant makers that will, you know, through whatever vehicle, through phone, through internet, through social media, through oh it, you know, in person you know, in person time <laughs> will grow that that community. It's a really critical part for us. I think we have time for just one more question. And I saw your hand up first, so it's going to this guy with speed over here. Thank you. I'm Dr. George Alula. I have one question which is uh, coming out of my mind after seeing Katrina and all those uh, tsunami in Japan uh, re recently. So uh, my question is a kind of uh, how you, the disaster specialist, which are in the room, I am not, how can we uh, bring in some solution to reduce level of ocean by irrigating some uh, I think one-fifth size of the world is a desert. So how can we bring those water to the desert, uh, putting all the technology that we have uh, in place to uh, bring all uh, the world global effort to regate those desert to get back the, the land? Uh, I will uh, try to explain myself. In uh, our housings in modern, modern uh, uh, city, you have five to three to four uh, bathroom, in which each bathroom you have two or three gallon of water stuck there. So we just learned that uh, uh, last Sunday, the world population come to seven billion. And if you know that every human being need a, about half gallon to drink per day, maybe by bringing clean water to all around the world or modernizing the, world, the rest of the world, we can fight those tsunami, those disasters, that, that is very, very painful for those who are experiencing it. Thus, my question will be, is it possible to find, to put the fund to irrigate the desert uh, around the world, just to get back the land to the human being? Thank you. Um, I think that what, what your question uh, raises uh, is, is, is very important, and that is that one of the issues that, that I think we will all face is is the redistribution of population. So there are, there are communities, you know, if you look at Bangladesh um, and you look at the trajectory for Bang Bangladesh and, and its, its net water rise, you know, it's very likely that m much of it will be gone in the next 40 years, at least the southern part of it. It's a huge delta and the southern part of it will be gone and the population will be shoved north. We're talking about displacing 20 million people. So the displacement of people is an international, will become uh, a growing international issue. We face the same thing, I hate to keep coming back to my home state, but it's my passion, but we face the same thing in Louisiana. Uh, in 50 years, there'll be a meter of water, and when you think that the highest point in Louisiana are bridges, you kind of understand what that means. I mean, you know, we just, we have no, we're flat as a pancake. So the water would literally be up around where we live, 75 miles from New Orleans north, would be the coastline of Louisiana if everything were kept uh, the same. So there are huge existential challenges that we face while other parts of the world are threatened with, with drought, as you so aptly point out. So the whole issue of kind of redistribution of people is something that hasn't even been discussed or anticipated when that may be in terms of preparedness, prepar preparedness an incredibly important uh, consideration. Yeah. That's a whole 
did you want to say? Yeah, one? sure. Um, <laughs> sir, are, are, are you from Mali? No, from Congo. From Congo, OK. Um, you know, you've just put your finger on what we might call the mother of all disasters. It's um, most of the audience probably knows there's a, almost a billion people that don't have access to safe drinking water and two and a half billion that as a result also don't have adequate sanitation. And then if you go down the hierarchy of needs, then you go into livelihoods and irrigating the land. And there needs to be integrated w water management that will address all those issues. But it's an enormous challenge. Um, w one of our foundation's strategic program areas is accessing safe water in the construct of a wash paradigm, water sanitation, hygiene, and livelihoods. But uh, along the lines John was talking about, I mean, th this is, it's a, it's a disaster waiting to happen. It's, it's, a, it's a silent tsunami in many respects in terms of the way this is affecting people's lives to, today. We, we, you know, we look at the big, very visible disasters, but this, this is really a quiet disaster in and of itself. Um, we we kind of are out of time, and I know there are a lot more questions, but we do have a reception um, that is, I think we're going to open the doors, and we have an hour where you can corner some of these wonderfully smart funders, not for money, but for information, <laughs> um, and, and ask some more questions. I will, um, uh, <laughs> if you want to. Um, but I just want to say in summary that, you know, we kind of ended up where we started, where is that, you know, philanthropy, you know, is more than a gap filler. We really um, can play a role, obviously, in the recovery process, in preparedness, um, and we, it's important to collaborate amongst each other, but also across sectors. And I would move to my friends at CSIS that we have a part two on philanthropy um, because I saw a lot of uh, more questions and this is a really great big audience. And uh, I thank you so much for coming and being here. And I think our wonderful panel. You did, but you know what? You opened.